Hello and welcome to the show. This is Mid-American Gardener and we're glad that you have joined us. We're here to talk about plants of all kinds, maybe a weevil. I don't know what we're going to talk about, but we're going to uh, enjoy hearing your questions and then answer those. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Science Department in the College of Aces here on the Urbana campus. However, we have three really talented folks. I'm gonna ask each one of them to give their expertise so you can hear that and really gauge your calls to what their expertise is. Mine would be perennials and cut flowers. Let's find out who our expert on the end, what his expertise is. This is Chuck Voigt. Hi, Chuck. Hello, Hello Diane. I am a vegetable and herb specialist here in the uh, Crop Sciences Department at the University of Illinois. And so questions on that would be good. I, you know, I know some other things too, but those would be my favorites. Uh, tonight, I brought a little friend along. <laughs> it's uh, a plastic weevil, and obviously they don't get this big. Phil Nixon good. would tell you there's never been a, a, an insect this big. It's part of having exoskeletons and those kinds of things. I got this guy at uh, Chicago Botanic Garden, and the reason I did was I was in the Rose Garden, and there were these, this group of, of very nice ladies. Very important uh, economically. Uh, the boll weevil basically came very close to uh, destroying the cotton industry in the South till they found ways to, to control it. it, would, you know, it ha they have this, this long snout and they just eat their way into things and, and destroy the, the, the developing cotton in the bowl so that it doesn't open right. Uh, the one we're probably more concerned with uh, in our part of the world would be plum curculio. That is C-U-R-C-U-L-I-O. That is a pest of, of things in the prunus family like plums and peaches and cherries apricots, uh, those kinds of things, but also apples and, and, and some of the palm fruits. And what it does is when it gets ready to lay an egg, it makes a hole, lays an egg in it, and then, and then cuts a smile under that so that the growing of the fruit doesn't smash the egg. So you get like a cyclops smiley face mm -hmm. uh, on the surface of, of the fruit, which is, is not what we like because it makes them look kind of bad. But weevils, uh, you know, part of the, the, the order of, of uh, the, the beetle order, oh geez, <coughs> beetles are the most numerous species of, of insects and, and weevils are a type of, of, of beetle. So they are a problem with lots of fruit. That's, <coughs> that's not great. I'm surprised you didn't work in any kind of pun about a weevil. You didn't do that. So. Well, it's clearly not the lesser of two weevils. Oh, <laughs> grim shot. You're welcome, Chuck. Someone had to help you out there. <laughs> but thank you for that primer about weevils because a lot of people I don't think realize what damage they well, cause. And they can get in stored grain. And there's, there's just weevils mm -hmm. that do a world of hurt. Okay. Well, they're just doing beetle stuff. but Yeah, uh, they're not trying to. They just want to eat. <coughs> yeah. So. Okay, thank you. And now in the middle, we're going to go to Dr. Jennifer Nelson. Tell us all about your expertise as well. Hi, I'm Jennifer Nelson. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, and I can field calls on general horticulture, uh, some vegetable questions, and just about any, I'll take a shot at anything else that comes our way, uh, houseplants also. And I brought a show and tell of a bargain houseplant I got back at the end of November, right before Thanksgiving. I only paid two ninety nine for this orchid. Wow! It was marked down. I have a, I have a weakness for clearance tables at <laughs> garden centers, which can be a bad thing. It's a good way to bring home a lot of pests and diseased plants, but if you know what you're looking for, you can get something that uh, will serve serve you well at home. This doesn't have very many flowers left on it, but it gives you an idea of the longevity. This is a Phalaenopsis orchid. I bought this the day before Thanksgiving and it still has a couple flowers hanging on. Wow. Uh, thing to look for is not, if you're looking for one marked down, don't even pay attention to the flowers. Look at the leaves and the leaves should not be wrinkled at all. If, they're, if the leaves are wrinkled up, it's a sign that there's a, an issue with water and it may be in the case of an orchid that's been put on a clearance table that that the roots are damaged. So you want to look for a good healthy plant. 
And orchids, uh, Phalaenopsis is the only one I know of that does this. It sends out one flower spike, and after those flowers are done, you can cut it off, and there are little side um, buds that will open up, and you can see this one, it's already been done. So you really don't want to do that more than one time on a, fail, a given Phalaenopsis shoot, but it's a good tip to remember. Boy, those leaves, that's about the prettiest leaf I've seen on orchids. They look really yeah. good for a bargain. Yeah. It is working. I've had some really spectacular catastrophes, but this one's working out really well. <laughs> well, good. One thing worked out. <laughs> yeah. all, all right. Well, we're going to go <coughs> next to you, Mike Brunk. Okay. My name is Mike Brunk. I'm a certified arborist. I'm the city arborist for Urbana. Uh, my specialty is trees. I'm also a licensed landscape architect, so I know a little bit about landscape questions, so you can throw a few of those this way, and I may be able to help you out there, too. I have a email that I'm going to share that I find very interesting and I think you will too. And um, the email uh, is titled Tree Stumped because I have a picture here of a stump and the gentleman Paul asked me, he says, uh, can you tell me what kind of tree this is with the center looking like this? Um, the picture uh, shows a tree trunk with decay but the interesting feature of this is the red stain. And the red stain uh, a lot of times is associated with fungus and rot inside the tree. So any tree can have a, a, a darkened decay like this on the inside, but more than likely this red stain is a box elder because that's common in box elder trees. The interesting feature of this is the red stain. And uh, it's associated a lot of times with fungus um, but it's uh, highly sought after with wood turners. So Paul may have a pretty valuable log uh, that wood turners may like to purchase from him and make into some beautiful pieces. Those are fascinating what yeah. they made them into. Yeah, it's, it, you, you, take, uh, it, you remove these box elders sometimes, and uh, as you saw on, on the TV, that was uh, extraordinarily beautiful with the red And that's an extremely big box elder, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. That's, sure. That's a good one. Well, yeah. thank you. We really appreciate our audience. They find some interesting questions for us, so thanks so much. Well, did you know that there is still some space on the Germany trip that I'm taking with a bunch of um, Mid-American Gardener viewers this July? And so we hope that you will sign up. We're going to visit uh, private and public gardens, some big ones, some small ones all across the country of Germany. So for more information, call WILL's Donda Beard, and that's at 333, well, 217-333-7300, or go to will.illinois.edu slash will travel. I think it's gonna be fun, and that's in July. Let's also go to a special Did You Know and learn a little something about grapes. Archaeologists have uncovered evidence that grapes were grown to make wine about 8,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. However, the ancient Egyptians were the first to record the process of making wine about 5,000 years ago. Grapes have been around for a while, and sounds like wine has too. So that's a little did you know fact. Well, thanks to Kathy for being our first viewer to call in. We're going to go to line okay. one, and she has an herb question. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Diane. Um, I was wondering, I'm trying to grow container gardening. Okay? Yes. All right, and what's your, what's your angle? I need to know what would be the best uh, potting soil or soil to use and what herbs will grow in what containers would be the best ones for containers? Do you know we have an herb specialist here on the show? Well, hi, Chuck Boyd. <laughs> hi. Well, I think <clears throat> most of the common herbs will work in a container. Um, <clears throat> as far as the soil mix, most of them appreciate really good drainage, so, so something that, that doesn't hold a lot of water would be, would be pretty good. Uh, moderate fertility. Um, they're 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 pretty adaptable to that. Um, a lot of the Mediterranean ones uh, like warm conditions, so you know a pot on a patio would work well with rosemary and 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 things of that basil. nature. Basil, mm -hmm. sure. Um, outside, you know, the sky's the limit in containers. Indoors, uh, things don't hold up nearly as well because they, they really are full sun plants 
and there's almost no place inside a house that has full sun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, could she do a perennial like thyme, if, you know, for outside? If she didn't right, if, keep if, it there, if if you're containerizing uh, perennials, uh, first of all, you want to have a pot that's not going to explode when it freezes and thaws, mm -hmm. and it needs to be a fairly large pot, so that it has a little more volume, and then probably insulated somehow mm -hmm. so that freezing and thawing is to a minimum, because that 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 can be an issue. Uh, if it's a small enough pot, you could even bury it for the winter. Mm -hmm. I like uh, calendulas, pot marigolds. I think that would be really pretty, and with some of the other mm -hmm. annuals, dill would be kind of fluffy in there. And sure, there's lots of choices. Could so be a thriller. Now, <laughs> yes, a thriller, a spiller, and a filler. That's what we always say. And what is your position with the Illinois Herb Association? Uh, advisor. Advisor. So yeah, we have. I was, I was in when it was being formed, and uh, I've kind of been in an advisory capacity since 1980. Nine. So he, ha <coughs> he goes to all kinds of herb uh, associations all over, it seems like. So you asked your question <coughs> on the right day. Thanks for that. Let's go to line two next. And Eddie has a question about emerald ash borer. Hi, Eddie. Hello. <coughs> um, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. I, uh, I was wondering what the status is of the emerald ash borer in Champaign County and more specifically in <coughs> Champaign-Urbana. And... Um, uh, and, and I guess also if there are signs of severe infection, the infestation, that's my question. Okay, and since we're mid-American gardener, you can <coughs> broaden it out from there if you wish to. Well, Mike. the emerald ash borer is coming down from the north, and it has been found in Champaign and Urbana. Uh, we in Urbana have identified six trees on uh, the public property right of way and probably about three trees on private property that have emerald ash borer, uh, have uh, positively been ID'd with emerald ash borer. We have about a dozen other that we suspect are infested with emerald ash borer. Um, Champagne, I couldn't tell you exact numbers, but they found uh, EAB in Champagne about two years before we did. So it's in town. Uh, people should be treating their trees that they want to salvage and save from EAB. Um, and um, I think that answers your question. But it is quite well sp widespread mm -hmm. north, and then how widespread south of here? Well, it keeps every year, it, it, it's following the interstates mm -hmm. uh, further south, uh, east and west, really. Um, but it's creeping down south. I know it's down into, uh, um, well, further south in our county, uh, uh, down where we have a little um, farmhouse in, uh, outside of Oakland, Illinois. Mm -hmm. So it's past that, um, but it's creeping little by little and it's being spread by firewood. Mm -hmm. uh, people are generally uh, purchasing firewood in infested areas uh, and they're taking along with them and they're moving the insect with the firewood. So purchase your firewood locally and burn firewood before the end of the season is over. And I think we do have an emerald ash borer graphic, if we can put that up. Um, so if you want more information, uh, there is a little bit about the emerald ash borer. So, but uh, the firewood is such, you know, that's the problem. <coughs> it is. So make sure yeah. that you say, well, it won't hurt if I do it this once. You don't mm -hmm. know that. So don't, just don't do it. What? Don't do it. I tell my <laughs> students six or seven times <coughs> in a row, I won't do that on the show right now because I know that you can learn with me just saying don't do it three times. All right, and Mike too. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> All right, well let's go on next to line three and we have a preen question with Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Hi, um, I have a lot of weeds in my garden bed and a lot of Virginia creeper and crabgrass and I wanted to try to use preen um, and I didn't know what it would do to my perennials and if it would do anything to the Virginia creeper. Okay, so preen with crabgrass and or Virginia creeper. Who wants to wade in? It might help on the crabgrass, but uh -huh. it, anything that's already uh, growing and established, it, it's a germination inhibitor, so it only works on seeds. So your perennials, it shouldn't affect, and I doubt it would have any effect on Virginia creeper. Anyone else? Not if yeah. it's not germinating. Right. Preen is gonna inhibit the seed. So, so you might get one out of two. Mm -hmm. So, and it won't hurt perennials. It's, the no. perennials are there, they're not germinating. Right. So, but make sure that you don't have critters, you know, that 
like chickens, you know, oh, if you don't yeah. put it around bird feeders, things mm. like that, that's a, that's a problem. Good point. Okay, well let's move on to line four and Wanda's got a question about magnolia. Hi Wanda. Are you there? Do you have a magnolia? I can hear something, Wanda. Okay, line four is gone. Maybe she'll be back, I don't know. But we also have an orchid question. So let's go to line five and see what Bill's question Hello? is for us. Oh, Wanda, are you back? I didn't leave. <laughs> uh, well, don't listen to your TV, listen to us. I, oh, yeah, I have it down. Okay, don't look at I it, don't listen. I have a magnolia in my front yard. Yes. And it's pretty, the leaves are pretty dead. I want to find out if there's something I can plant under it because it's just this scraggly little stuff, but I'd like to make that area look more presentable. Does it have white flowers or the pink flowers? It's white with a little kind of a blush of magnolia, a kind of like. Pink? Blush of pink, you mean? Okay. I don't know, because there's a white one and yeah. there's a white blush pink one. Mm -hmm. It's, it's I quite, take it it's a probably a saucer. Saucer. Magnolia. So Magnolia syringiana. Okay, what can you plant under that? I have an idea. Mulch. Mulch. Yeah, <laughs> lots of I, mulch. I would not recommend growing grass under a magnolia. They're shallow rooted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we've got a tree specialist here, so well, just jump you, right in. You know, you might try pachysander or periwinkle. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I have um, I have yeah. periwinkle under a, a star magnolia. Yeah. She, she has to be very careful whatever she decides to mm -hmm. plant. Those might work, and but you'll damage the tree. So you have to be very careful about um, the tree roots. You do not want to cultivate under the drip line of that tree. Uh, you'll, you'll want to buy very small perennials if you buy pachysander, vinca, or another ground cover like that, uh, seedlings even, and drill them in, uh, in the drip line. Uh, very small holes. They have little bulb augers that are about an inch in diameter and you can be careful that way and, and plant around roots. But generally, I think the first answer is correct. Mulch is probably your best and safest uh, solution. And when you say drip line, he means along the outside edge and let them grow in. Mm -hmm. I see people building up soil, planting near the tree. Mm -hmm. That is terrible, don't do that. Mm -hmm. I planted my uh, ground covers at the time I planted the tree. Yeah, that's a very mm -hmm. good idea. Outside the existing roots. Mm -hmm. um, it was well outside. Yeah, it's a good time to do it. But now that you have one established, <coughs> uh, just be careful. So if you have to plant plants, but we like mulch. <laughs> so, but you can do a combination maybe also. All right, well, let's go to the orchid question. I guess Bill is on line three with an orchid question. Hi there, Bill. Hello, hi. Yeah, I've got a Phalaenopsis, which has been a really good bloomer and had a nice spike coming out of it. And I was uh, working with it a couple of days ago, and I broke the tip of the spike off, which has all those little, you know, the beginning buds on it. Um, and I'm just wondering, have I ruined it for this season, or will some more buds appear on that orchid? That's my question. Well. I've done the same thing more than once, uh, <laughs> and uh, I would say just watch and wait. If you look along that f what that flower spike, you'll see these little triangular shaped um, their buds, their side their side shoots, and they will once you've removed that uh, main flower spike, those should develop more flower buds. It's going to take several weeks though, but don't cut it all the way off. Just watch and wait. And, and you're you could not alone. be surprised. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a good question. And when you're in doubt, I'd say do nothing in most cases. Well, let's uh, do a houseplant question before we go to some emails. And this is Barbara on line one. Hi, Barbara. Hello. I enjoy your show. Thank you uh, so much. I have a houseplant that I call it shamrock. Mm -hmm. And I saw them years ago, and they were green. Well, the one I got in a in kind of a community pot at the garage sale with a cactus. Uh, it's purplish. Oh, yeah, I love that red. one. Red, it's real deep mm -hmm. reddish purple, mm -hmm. and it, it, uh, it'll die all down. And then, I don't know, you think the whole thing is, you've lost it, and it'll all come up again. And before it dies again, it'll bloom little bitty tiny flowers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're, like I said, it's reddish purplish. And I call it shamrock. I'd like to know more about it. Okay. Well, it's called oxalis. So that's O X 
A L I S oxalis. <laughs> it's a, and it's actually you can sometimes find it in bulb catalogs. I've seen it sold as a summer bulb, and I actually used it in a mixed uh, summer bulb pot one year. So it is a teeny tiny bulb, and that's why it's dying off on you. It's just going through its natural life cycle. But you were very smart to keep it and not throw it away. Lots of people throw it away and think they did something wrong. Well, and I like to have it in pots, and then I'll divide it and put it outside, let those die out mm -hmm. for the winter. But I still have some in the pots. And I put it in with several ground, uh, several of my house plants, and then put them out in the summer. It's just, I really like it. It's easy to grow. So you've got a nice oxalis, or shamrock is a good name too. Okay, let's go to some emails, and <coughs> we'll go back around and start with you, Chuck. Okay, <clears throat> this one's about fingerling potatoes. The question is, can I start fingerling potatoes and shallots in containers in the mildly heated greenhouse, 55 to 60 degrees, in February? <clears throat> okay. You asked two questions. Shallots, if you, if you really want to get a jump start on the season, starting those in February, probably okay. They're going to start growing. Um, you can put shallots outside because they're very cold tolerant. You could put those out usually by mid to late March, early April. Uh, so starting in February, they probably would still be okay uh, to do that. Uh, potatoes, <clears throat> February is pretty early to be starting potatoes um, because they're not gonna, the top growth is not gonna be safe outside until mid-May probably in most of the area that we're calling mm -hmm. mid-America. Um, what you can do with, with fingerling potatoes in a greenhouse is wait a little longer than that and then get them pre-sprouted and get those sprouts greened up. And then when you plant them, they'll, they'll come up very quickly. But uh, mm -hmm. that's probably only going to take maybe a month to happen. And uh, so you can probably plant them in the garden maybe mid-April. So maybe mid-March you could, you, could, you could get them started that way. Um, well, I'm, I'm writing notes. That's a really good idea about pre-sprouting. Mm -hmm. right. So mid-April to plant for, or mid-March yeah, to plant for mid-April. And, and with shallots, I've had problems okay. you know, fall planting shallots for some reason. They don't come through the winter all that mm -hmm. well. And sometimes I can't get them out as early in the spring as I would like. And uh, pre-sprouting them it might, be, might be a good thing mm -hmm. because you can, you can get them going early. And then by the time the day length tells them to make bulbs, uh, they have more energy and and, and that'd make be great. bigger bulbs. So, okay. Well, that was a very interesting question. Thank you again, viewers and Chuck. Let's go to you, Jennifer. Okay. <coughs> well, continuing with the orchid theme, I've got a question from a viewer on their Phalaenopsis orchid. They say that the orchid's leaves are turning dark purplish green and looking leathery. Is it too much or not enough water, light, fertilizer? What is going on? Um, well. The looking leathery part, as long as they're not they're not wrinkly, the Phalaenopsis leaf is naturally kind of thick and succulent, and I don't know if I'd call it leathery or not. But if it's looking wrinkly, there may be a problem with the water. There may be a problem with the roots because the plant is not getting enough water. Uh, the dark purplish green, sometimes that's an indicator of too much light, and it's the first step on the way to being sunburned. But also sometimes it's just part of the genetics of the plant. And a lot of times the orchids with dark purple flowers tend to have a little bit of purplish cast to them, especially on the underside of the leaf. So that's something to just experiment with your light levels and see if maybe moving it to a little less light improves that purple color. It can be a sign of phosphorus deficiency too, but light is more likely. Okay, we like our orchid theme. Well, hey, Mike, can you answer a quick question? You'll okay. be our last one, I All think. All right, here's a quickie. It's about shedding bark. Uh, this person has a, a tree that's about 75 to 80 years old. After each windy rainstorm, it uh, sheds much bark and it's scattered over the ground. Um, she knows it's a sycamore, and there's another sycamore uh, just about as old in the backyard that's not doing the same thing. So why is this one tree shedding, and should she worry? Uh, this is a natural feature of a sycamore tree or a London plane tree, and so there's no need to worry. Uh, it's what gives the tree a beautiful mottled uh, color. You'll see patches, uh, uh, patches of color of cream, beige, yellow, white, and up in the upper parts of the tree it's all white because all of the bark is shed off. Mm -hmm. 
So why one tree is doing it another, I would say maybe one tree is a little older than the other, could be a little different microenvironment, it could be that one's growing a little faster because it's getting a little more water, but there's some little genetic difference uh, or microenvironment difference between the two trees that's causing one to shed uh, over the other, but nothing to worry about. And does it help for pollution? I mean, that sheds and that actually is good in an area that has some pollution too, isn't it? You as, know, as far as uh, you know, that shedding doesn't cause the tree any harm. Oh no, it doesn't cause the tree any harm, and I mean she can leave the bark on the ground depending on what it looks like. She has turf here. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe even something you could mow over. That's right. Um, well, I'm going to have to wrap it up. Okay. Thank you, folks, so much for all your questions, and thank you for watching, and you folks for being here. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>